So I'd like to call the meeting to order at 9 o'clock a.m. I'd like to ask as a courtesy to all of you that you silence your cell phones and mute your connection if you joined us on Teams. Each director received notice of this committee meeting. The public meeting notice was properly posted as required by law. Directors, for the attendance record, when your name is called, please unmute yourself and let us know that you are here. Nancy, would you please call on each committee member to record the attendance? Chairman Lattimore. Here. Director Lloyd. Present. Director Fernandez. Present. Director Lachance. Present. Director Luton. Present. Director Wilson. Present. Presiding Officer Flores. Present. Director Tallis. Director Taylor. Thank you very much. We do have a quorum of the committee present. We'll now move to the comments the public comments section of our agenda. For those commenting, please note that the committee may not deliberate items that are not posted on our agenda. Additionally, we do not plan to place a time limit <coughs> on public comment unless we feel the time being taken is affecting others' ability to address the committee. Question. There's a question. Yes, sir. This is a director, Gary Bourne. I think there's some of us that are not on the committee. Do we need to state that we're we're uh, attending the meeting, Nancy? We can. So I had a director Boren, director Henderson, and director Huber that I know we're going to join. President. And this is director Crone. Director Crone. Okay, got it. Anybody else? Director Savage. Director Savage and director. Anybody else? Talis. All right, gotcha, Talis. Just to just to clarify, uh, even though directors who are not part of the committee attend the meeting, they're here strictly for observation in won't enter into the voting, although we welcome you to be, be here and hear what we're saying. Any other questions? At this time, we have no one signed up to speak. Is there anyone out there who did not sign up but wishes to address the committee? I hear no one uh, requesting to address the committee, so we'll proceed with the regular agenda. Uh, David Collinsworth and John Dixon will review the purpose and RFP process for establishing the property management master plan. Gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer Lattimore, and uh, welcome to the board. Welcome to everyone that's uh, joined us, uh, whether uh, you're a presenter or you're following along on YouTube this morning. We appreciate you tuning in, uh, especially given the fact that we've got uh, pending weather maybe uh, in the next couple of days. So we appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, first of all, what we want to do is uh, this is a really unique world that we're living in uh, and, and BRA is still trying to get accustomed to uh, meetings on uh, video. So uh, this will be the first meeting that we've ever had with our board or with a committee that's actually selecting a firm or proposing a firm uh, for the staff to begin negotiations with to take to our full uh, board in October. Uh, so in all fairness uh, to both firms that we're going to interview at this time, I'm actually going to draw a name out of a hat to determine the order of uh, how we're going to proceed. So what we've done, John, uh, I've got the names of both firms written on uh, a yellow sticky note uh, and it's behind a piece of paper so neither John nor I can see. Uh, and I'm going to put them in the hat, and John's going to hold them above my head and shake them, and I'll reach up. Ready? All right. And the firm that will go first this morning uh, is Half and Associates. 
So in about five minutes, uh, when John and I are done, uh, we look forward to hearing from half. And then Siglo, you guys will follow shortly thereafter. So uh, really what I wanted to do is just give you all uh, uh, a real brief overview of what we're trying to accomplish this morning, uh, because it's the beginning of something that, that our staff thinks is uh, very, very significant. Uh, we are looking for a firm uh, to help us uh, put together a property master plan, uh, evaluating all of the uh, properties in the BRA portfolio. Uh, and I typically wouldn't read to you, but uh, I want to read to those of you that uh, aren't involved in the process if you're following along on YouTube, because I want you to realize the breadth of everything that we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, so what the BRA is looking for is a highly qualified consulting firm uh, to help us with a evaluation of real property, a development of a comprehensive land management plan, development of a comprehensive land holding inventory system, uh, helping us evaluate our properties for the protection of water quality, uh, helping us uh, evaluate issues regarding endangered species, environmental concerns, uh, historical archaeological concerns, uh, hydrological and flooding uh, assessments, uh, stakeholder outreach and engagement, uh, recreational planning, master planning, surveying, and really just uh, uh, helping our staff, which are water people, uh, understand uh, the value to our property and how to best use our property going forward. Uh, so it's going to be a multi-year process, uh, and we're really excited about this uh, uh, undertaking. This was something that uh, uh, when our staff visited with our presiding officer, uh, Cynthia Flores, uh, she thought it was important enough that we that we create a committee of the board, uh, and, and that's what we did. So uh, uh, Chairman Lattimore, with that, uh, we're excited to get started, and I'll turn the show back over to you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, let's uh, let's begin then with the uh, with the presentations. Um, and uh, according to the order that uh, that you just drew on the yellow note, I'll turn the floor over to our first presenter. David, we may need some help. We had uh, we requested control. Um, request control. We're requesting control to uh, share. Okay, Courtney, are you out there? Courtney's here. Yeah. I think you'll have to uh, allow the top. Not sure. Where the administrator yeah. is. Let me see. There you go. Okay. It's, it, I hit it, but it's taking a while. Um, And I'm not, I might add, all of us are new to this process, so maybe a little patience is in order, but I think we'll get it handled here. Uh, this is Director Savage. I'm pretty familiar with the Microsoft Teams. Uh, you could go and just uh, share your screen. Oh, okay, there it looks like. All right. I think we're ready. Sorry about that. It just took a while to load. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we're ready. Go ahead. Well, good morning. My name is Andrew Eichert. I'm with Health Associates. First of all, I just want to say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to uh, present our qualifications today for this BRA Property Master Plan interview. Health Associates has had the opportunity to work directly with the Brazos River Authority for over 15 years. Uh, we've developed strong working relationships with BRA staff. Uh, we've dealt with projects up and down the basin, so we're very familiar with many of the lands that BRA currently owns. 
We realize that this project, as David alluded to, is going to require a multidiscipline approach. So we've assembled a team uh, with expertise in multiple areas to enable us to accomplish uh, the goals that BRA has for this project. So again, thank you for your time this morning. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our project manager, Lenny Hughes. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Lenny Hughes, the Regional Director of Lance Park Church and Planning of Path Associates. As far as this process, uh, as, as Andrew had mentioned before, uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing that uh, to be in lockstep with BRA, your mission and your goals. And so this is what we had assembled as before we even received anything as far as the presentation to make sure that your mission statement is first and foremost in our mind as we start to move forward throughout this process. So after our meeting in February of this year, uh, we looked at some key components and also based on the description of items that BRA would like to follow as part of the overall presentation. Understanding that looking at the long-term retention plans and policies for land development management, uh, looking at GIS as a, not only a toolbox, toolbox, but also a way to help manage and guide uh, the opportunities that BRA, BRA has for their, for their properties and natural resources. Also to share with you our experience and uh, history of BRA, as well as our master plan experience from various projects across the region, as well as our understanding of BRA staff, their stakeholders, and make sure their needs uh, meet, meet your goals. Half Associates, we're a multidisciplinary firm. Uh, we are uh, roughly about 950 uh, members with, with 14 offices in the state of Texas. My, our background has been in landscape architecture, planning, civil engineering, H&H &H hydrology, natural resources. So we have a very strong bench strength of, of folks that we would like to have to work on as part of this process. Uh, myself, I'll be the project manager. I've got 25 years experience with Half Associates. My background has been in parks, recreation planning, strategic master planning, extensive stakeholder engagement, grant writing, as well as helping to facilitate and coordinate many multiple large scale projects such as this. You've already heard from Andrew Eichert. He's the principal in charge. He's got 19 years of experience, 15 of those with BRA. And again, he also has a strong experience in working with different lakes that you guys have here with the area, such as Possum Kingdom, Grand Barry Limestone, as well as working at Lower Brazos uh, River Basin. Your deputy project manager, Russell Marshak, he has 22 years of environmental experience, specializing in conservation and restoration plans, habitat assessment, land banking and mitigation, as well as very versed in GIS coordination. Another key member of our, our planning and planning team is uh, Aaron Atkinson. He has 23 years of experience. Uh, he, is, he is also the lead for our innovative technologies, which is an IT task force leader. Uh, he has also uh, been uh, very uh, instrumental in the development of several platforms that are GIS based to help many organizations such as yourself to help manage and, and operate uh, your, your, your facilities. Another key half member is also Kirk Wilson. He has 20 to one, 21 years of large lake master planning experience, uh, working with lake facilities and planning efforts, as well as uh, developing engineering and design manuals for, for these properties. We also have other key members, such as IES. IES, is, is, we've worked with IES on many uh, of these type of projects. Their background also is environmental and cultural resources assessment. Uh, they are currently working with BRA on, on several projects, as well as being located within 10 minutes of their, of, of their uh, headquarters here. Another key member is JLL. Their, their experience is looking at the property evaluation uh, they have uh, appraised over 2,400 properties in the state of Texas with over 80 real estate appraisers, as well as having experience on Possum King and Lake on some of the, your past, uh, past divestiture of your, of your properties there. Then lastly, another key member is Dean Runyon. Dean Runyon is a, has national as well as local market recreational experience. And so he'll be utilizing the experience to look at some of the camping opportunities, tourism, economics, uh, and also the financial and physical analysis of, of your facilities here uh, for BRA. I have associates, and we have over 35 years of planning experience. This includes small city parks up to private development, to large city, county, and regional master plans. These included uh, park and recreation open space plans, comprehensive plans, natural resource management studies, FEMA storm studies, uh, lake and river corridor studies, as well as large utility and drainage master plans. We also have looked at and, and been, been, have experience in, in, in conservation restoration plans, uh, Section 404 uh, compensatory uh, mitigation, 
aquatic resource uh, relocation as well as urban forestry plans. From these plans, we have to look at developing strategies. These strategies look, include a land bank for shoreline protection, flood mitigation, habitat protection, water quality protection, as well as starting to prioritize, implement, and look at phasing measures for implementation for, for these projects. These projects will also look at uh, long, short, and midterm strategies. Uh, what are the opportunities out there for potential partnerships? What are the lease and sublease agreements with cities and counties and nonprofits to, again, uh, look at other types of uh, partnering opportunities, as well as looking at private concessionaires for marinas, commercial, retail, lodging, as well as uh, areas that we would like to divest. So the importance of master planning, this is to help to develop an overall vision and guiding for current and future uh, uses. Uh, it also looks at the uh, recreation and operation and maintenance opportunities. Uh, looks at also the prioritized initial developments as well as future uh, land development. Our experience ranges from uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where we did uh, four late studies, which included Lake Grapevine, Louisville, Ray Roberts, and Lebon. Uh, their mission statement is very similar to the BRA's mission and goal statement. Uh, they are also looking at the essence of water resource management, flood risk reduction, habitat protection, and recreation. And so some of the outcomes for this plan was looking at a district-wide uh, engineering manual for the Metroplex wet lakes, as well as a business plan. And also we helped them develop a national foundation to look at collecting money and funds for uh, reinvesting into their park and, and recreation system there. Lake Ralph Hall is a new lake. This is a 12,000 acre mass plan. Uh, as part of this process, we looked at evaluation matrix that looked at the shoreline areas along Lake Ralph Hall, uh, looking at levels for flood levels, wetland area protection, as well as private and, pop, private and public property ownership, and what is the best value for these lands right here. Uh, with this, we looked at future residential development, commercial development, uh, areas that the, the BR, that uh, Upper Trinity would like to keep and maintain as part of their own land holdings, but also potential for partnerships for a divestiture of some of their lands. The lastly, also Cherokee Nation Park. This is a 100-acre mass plan that looked at a very extensive environmental analysis of the shoreline areas of, of along Robert S. Kerr Reservoir in Oklahoma. Here we work with Dean Mundy and Associates and also with Russell and his, his guys to look at the environmental aspects of it, what areas you would like to protect to preserve, as well as to keep that natural integrity, but also how can we look at this lake and look at future uh, development opportunities for recreation and, and also as well as making this a destination uh, resort type facility for, for, for the Cherokee Nation. As part of this process, uh, uh, this question number three, we are, our, our, our process is tried and true. Uh, we have five initial stages for that, of, the, of this process. Where we look at coordinate, looks at the overall project initiation, where we have meetings uh, with the, uh, plan, uh, the with the BRA staff as well as key stakeholders, as well as having a facility-wise tour of all your uh, of your land holdings. Secondly, we like to collect, and we had mentioned that there's also a very extensive database that we would like to have as part of this overall process, and it goes from the properties as well as leases, as well as understanding the natural resources and cultural resources that you have here. This will start to help develop the, the framework and baseline for our approach. Next, we want to analyze. Analyze the properties for a potential divestiture, also looking at opportunities for recreation, as well as preliminary planning for, for the uh, BRA uh, land holdings. Next, we want to organize. Here, we'll look at developing a customizable GIS dashboard that would help on day-to-day -day operations, but as well as looking at future opportunities for, for, for the divestiture, as well as implementation strategies and phasing for, for the project. Then lastly, is being able to develop an overall comprehensive plan for land development, land management, as well as policies for, uh, for, for such improvements. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Aaron Atkinson to walk us through our GIS approach. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, Half Associates has been using GIS since 1987. Uh, we've used GIS for a lot of the efforts to collect data. Um, as over the last 20 years, we've really moved into uh, using the web-based GIS and mobile GIS. And so we have quite a few uh, projects under our belt for uh, developing mobile apps and pulling all this information together. Uh, we've actually worked on one of these with the PK Rangers going around on the boats and collecting uh, boat, uh, the dock locations uh, using mobile GIS. But really, when we look at a, a property master plan like what BRA is looking at, next slide Russell, 
Uh, we want to move this beyond just the traditional GIS or the web GIS. We want to start integrating that with a traditional database in the back end. Our in-house software developers have taken that and developed uh, web applications that show not only maps where uh, properties are located, uh, we can symbolize those to show the status, but behind the scenes, uh, we're allowing users to log in and access detailed information uh, that is more of a, a database approach. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a, a highway corridor uh, for a new uh, highway down in Houston. Uh, it's going from design through survey, environmental, uh, and ultimately construction. This whole project is being tracked in the back end within the database. The map is showing you the status of each of the parcels of interest, uh, but then you can drill in and really get into uh, the documents behind things, right of entry, uh, easement information, and be able to bring that forward out in the field uh, so it's readily at your hands. Next slide, please. One of the other projects we highlighted in our statement of qualifications was Maybe Ranch. Uh, this one is very uh, similar to uh, what we believe BRA is looking for. Again, we have a, a GS database uh, tied in with a traditional database, and they're tracking property ownership, leases, easements, uh, and they also have the mobile GIS to support uh, field investigations. What are they finding when they go and visit their properties? What's of interest? Uh, this ties into a dashboard. It allows uh, the stakeholders to be notified that there's an issue or that maybe a renewal date is coming up uh, and it's very convenient to be able to put everything together and because it's all a, a web-based interface uh, the training really drops off you don't have to be a GIS expert to understand how to pull all this information together uh, really if you can log into a website uh, everything is driven for you our typical training times uh, for these types of applications usually about half a day and then people are off to the races able to pull the information they need as they need it and it's the most current uh, data that's available. So with that I'd like to turn it over to the Lenny. Thank you Aaron. Question number four uh, looks at potential challenges but also for our for our standpoint you know what kept us up at, at night since our, our February meeting. And so and you know from that meeting you know we wanted to make sure that we understand the overall product scope I'll also understand the nuances of BRA and the different organizational priorities of BRA. And since uh, our meeting in February and all that this happened since uh, March with COVID-19, now stakeholder engagement is also gonna be a key as part of this process. So we wanna make sure that we are uh, not only engaging but informing, but also looking at means and methods to be able to get the message out there to, uh, to, to all the other uh, participants and users there. The last one, how do we develop a, a comprehensive a plan and package this final product? So looking at determining the project scope, uh, we felt that we, we should have a pre-scoping meeting to establish the overall scope and priorities of BRA. Uh, from there, uh, look at and having a kickoff meeting to help, again, establish the framework uh, schedule, as well as understanding our approach to COVID-19. And we're gonna share with you some of those, our approaches uh, for that a little bit later on in the presentation. We also want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, understanding that BR is a mission as far as emergency planning, climate change, water availability, uh, working with the overall uh, organizational uh, setup of, of BRA, as well as understanding your initiatives, as well as some of your uh, things that are best out there. Thank you, Lenny. So once we have this, the scope defined, uh, we realize that, that BRA has many other initiatives ongoing right now. We don't want this BRA property master plan to operate in a vacuum. It needs to integrate and complement other initiatives that BRA has ongoing. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see four uh, initiatives that, I know there's many more, but this is four I wanted to kind of touch on today. So the Allen's Creek Reservoir, uh, BRA obviously has that land, but if there's potential mitigation that's associated with construction of that dam, that may require uh, land assets as well. So we wanna make sure that as Allen's Creek moves forward that that, that process is integrated into our BRA property master plan. On the state water plan, BRA has been instrumental in that process since its inception in the late 1990s. Uh, so as new alternative water supplies are identified that may require land, we wanna make sure that integrates with BRA's assets. And then the state flood plan, which will be starting up here in the next couple of months. Uh, BRA again will be instrumental in uh, the Brazos River Basin in terms of that state flood planning. So if there's flood mitigation alternatives, we wanna be sure those integrate in with the BRA property master plan. 
And then again, the integrated water resources plan, which we know BRA is just now launching. Again, as new water resources are identified, we wanna make sure that those land assets are captured. So how are we gonna do this? Uh, well, it's gonna be a lot of communication with BRA staff, uh, just to stay up to speed on these other initiative, initiatives and make sure that uh, we're not operating in a vacuum on the BRA property master plan. In addition to the various initiatives, we also know that there's, there's uh, a lot of different organizations and departments within the BRA structure. This graphic here just shows some of the organizations that we will want to interface with as we develop this, this property master plan. Again, different uh, departments may have different um, priorities, so we want to be sure those are integrated. And we actually have experience doing this. Half Associates led the uh, PK Granberry Whitney Water Management Study several years ago. Uh, this the required interaction with multiple departments with BRA. We got to know the staff. Uh, the different priorities of the different groups, had a lot of stakeholder engagement. So we've been there, we've done this with BRA before, and we look to continue that same model moving forward with the BRA property master plan. We mentioned that uh, stakeholder engagement is also gonna be key as part of this process. And at this kickoff meeting, we not only wanna establish the priorities, but also establish, as, uh, as Andrew mentioned before, all the different key stakeholders, boards, and organizations that, that is made up of our BRA. So with that, uh, stakeholder engagement has many levels. It's a one-on-one, the steering committee. Uh, we felt that a steering committee uh, would be important to help guide us throughout this process, but also a technical committee from, from a staffing standpoint, provide looks at uh, the day-to-day -day operations so that we are in lockstep with, with how this plan would be developed. Uh, here in this process, we look at online surveys, uh, also an interactive map that could be locational as, as well as by region, as well as having a a very innovative approach uh, with COVID-19 with having a virtual public engagement toolbox. Next slide. So the final product is, again, it's gonna be a GIS database uh, where we would look at having a customizable tool uh, for BRA to help manage and storage uh, these different opportunities, as well as um, uh, looking at a recreation market assessment, land and property evaluation, uh, opportunities for divestiture, as well as um, a phase of master planning initiatives for overall approach. Question five, how does our process align with BRA's mission? Uh, BRA's mission half will help plan for operational necessity, flood damage mitigation, uh, make sure that we are uh, at the water quality and quality protection is, is first and foremost as, as part of our as, as part of our process as well as the overall habitat conservation and protection of some of the uh, natural and protected areas. Uh, from there, we look at a future for potential recreational site development, as, land, as well as lands we would like to hold and, and divest. So, Lenny mentioned we want to look at the operational necessity as we assess uh, different properties that BRA owns. How does that fit into the framework of BRA's operational necessity? Well, we know that BRA supplies water. So, uh, BRA owns and operates multiple water supply projects, including dams, uh, some groundwater wells. In addition to that, uh, BRA either owns or operates water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants throughout the basin. So again, these are land assets that need to be considered. And then moving this water around the basin through pipelines and pump stations, these water supply conveyance systems have easements and right of way. So these are all land holdings and land assets that need to be evaluated as part of this. So how are we gonna uh, uh, evaluate this? Again, we're gonna use that GIS toolbox, which Aaron mentioned earlier. Uh, we're gonna set up an evaluation matrix, which Aaron will talk about here in a few minutes. But for each parcel, we're gonna look at, you know, how close is it to an existing BRA facility that, that serves an operational necessity? So is it adjacent to a, a dam site? Is it adjacent to a, a groundwater well? And if there's future expansion needed of those assets, uh, if there's not room on the, the parcel that that, that facility is currently at, then we want to consider that and maybe we don't want to divest of, of land that's adjacent to an existing facility to, to prepare for future expansion. So again, just and, and going back to the initiatives, the integrated water resources plan, understanding uh, what future water supply needs are within the basin and making sure that we plan what to do with property, it aligns with these other plans and initiatives that BRA has. 
Another component is flood and damage mitigation. Um, we have had the opportunity to work on several flood studies throughout the Brazos River Basin. This graphic here on the left is from the 2016 flood down in the lower Brazos Basin near Waller in uh, Fort Bend County. Uh, we know there's a lot of flood damage, uh, especially in the lower part of the basin. So as BRA looks at a piece of land and potentially could it provide some flood damage mitigation, there's several factors we wanna look at again. Again, we'll go back to our GIS tool. We'll use this evaluation matrix and for each parcel of land, we'll, we'll see how suitable it is for a flood mitigation strategy. Uh, specific criteria we might look at or what is the topography of the site? Is it steep? Is it flat? How big is the parcel of land? Are there environmental constraints, which Russell will talk about in just a moment that may hinder or limit what we can do in terms of a flood mitigation alternative? If we elect to move forward with a flood mitigation alternative or BRA elects to move forward with a flood mitigation alternative or, or potentially on a piece of land, what benefit would that provide and who would it benefit? So those are the types of things we want to quanti quantify and determine if there's a higher or better use for that piece of property moving forward. Okay, uh, good morning. This is Russell Matashock. I'm going to speak a little bit to the water quality uh, threat endangered species and wetland mitigation or, or, or water resources mitigation uh, slides all at once because really how we do that, you know, it kind of follows the same uh, processes. For those familiar with GIS, we have certain things like vegetation classes, aquatic resources, certain cultural resources, recreational and residential information or land use information certain utility information and then also with our floodplain experience we have floodplain models up and down the uh, Brazos River Basin. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Kevin Stone on board for archaeological sites. You know these are also uh, features or resources that can influence how you might manage a piece of property so you know having him on board and his familiarity, familiarity with BRA resources you know kind of puts us that far ahead in that regard uh, what we like to do is we like to take that information that's out there and just available for anybody to use and it you know provides a high level uh you know implication of what resources out there and we try to drill down a little bit more and do our own uh investigation of the data and i'm going to use a couple of projects as examples one being the Lower Brazos River Flood Study, one being a Cedar Bayou Watershed Study. Uh, for the former, it was actually mapping these resources as constraints to implementing large-scale uh, floodplain mitigation projects, very similar to what Andrew just described. Uh, for the Cedar Bayou, it kind of took it that next step forward and uh, not only looked at what features might be constraints, but also what remaining features might be best suited for uh, wetland mitigation, if not for floodplain management. So we take the baseline data and what you can see here is uh, we took in, you know, different types of hydrology data and we ultimately do our own analysis and we kind of assign you know, certain weight values to different uh, data fields within the GIS data. You know, at the same, and then we kind of take the uh, soil information and we kind of go through that same process. And on the right, you see a little chart where we assign these values. And then we go in and we look at the vegetation and whatever vegetation class, you know, information we use, there's additional information within that data that allows us to develop some probability areas. And ultimately, we develop our own half unique map, which, uh, kind of identifies opportunities or hot spots. And this right here is from the uh, Lower Brazos River Flood Study. You know, the blues are stuff that you can probably get from that basic information. Same thing with the orange, but what really the greens and the light blues are the stuff that pops out of our own model. And you know, that can really be done. It can be this particular example is for wetlands. We can do that for streams. We can, you know, adapt that to uh, threat endangered species. And then at the end, we want to talk about market opportunities. If this is um, uh, just a, a BRA specific bank, well, it's not that big a deal because you can, uh, you know, service your own watershed, so to speak, in terms of mitigation. If you want to be entrepreneurial and 
you know, then we would want to look at exactly what your potential client base may be based on your location within the Brazos watershed. Uh, from a water quality standpoint, it may be a little bit challenging to look at, uh, you know, a particular piece of property and say that piece of property is what needs to be, you know, preserved for water quality. However, you know, the concepts of wetland mitigation and habitat preservation, those are themes consistent. They're generally consistent with desired, you know, water quality and the exercise of going through and determining whether or not a piece of property may be suitable for mitigation, uh, you know, for T&E or wetlands, at the end of the day, we may decide that's not a route BRA wants to go, uh, but we still have a lot of valuable information to look at, uh, you know, water quality alternatives as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dean, who is going to talk about recreation. Uh, as I mentioned, couple of times already, we want to be sure that market factors are considered very carefully as part of this planning process. Uh, we've provided this assistance in a number of previous projects. We've already mentioned the Cherokee Nation project, for example. Uh, a couple of others that Dean Runyon Associates has worked on, their natural resource-oriented projects, or the Galveston Island State Park planning project, and a, a large 70,000-acre project up in Cook County in Illinois, which was also uh, very similar to this, wanted to take a look at the range of land resources that they have from a uh, land planning and uh, property development perspective. Uh, we also are the recreation, I'm sorry, the uh, travel and tourism consultant for the state of Texas and have done that research for uh, many years. Uh, for this project, we want to be sure that uh, when we look at individual parcels, we consider recreation activities uh, and facilities, look at markets for those, consider land use. Uh, markets might range from local and regional markets, which would be particularly important. For example, we have Possum Kingdom up here, uh, which would relate very strongly to the Dallas-Fort Worth market area. But tourism is also an interesting factor that uh, potential for bringing people to the PRA lands from much more distant locations. Uh, Possum Kingdom, just to look at the, the range of considerations you might have, uh, already has quite a lot of activity on it. Uh, we would look at all of this from a market perspective. What are those comparable facilities? What kind of information might they provide? Uh, there's also a, a state park on that lands. Uh, we would do the analysis uh, on a location by location basis since the market for each location is going to be uh, different because of the different resource characteristics as well as the proximity to population areas. Uh, for purposes of integrating this information into a GIS system, we take a look at things like the location of a site with respect to water, uh, value of the site, existing and adjacent uses that might affect the uh, use and value of that particular parcel. Water quality has a lot to do with the quality of the recreation that might be uh, po possible on that particular parcel. So we would look at all of that for purposes of integrating the recreation data into the GIS system. Uh, if we get down to particular parcels or locations for analysis purposes, can you get to the next slide? Uh, we begin to look at more detailed information that has to do with the, the actual potential of that site or location for further development. That development we consider things like recreation fees, mission fees, concession, short-term rental, and so on. When you're looking at anything at that level, you also want to pay, pay careful attention to operating costs, such as any staffing, maintenance, overhead, uh, and so on. One thing that we can provide if there is interest is an analysis of economic benefits. These are you know, like economic impacts associated with site development. Revenue might help cover the operating costs, but also provide benefits in the community and in the region, such as sales, employment, earnings, and tax receipts to local uh, governments and other operations. Erin? 
Thank you, Dean. So as our team has talked about, uh, we're considering a lot of different factors uh, and we're wanting this to align up with the BRA operations and how it goes together. But how do we quantify all this information and really uh, apply that to the analysis step, you know, and, and give some answers that have uh, the quantifiable information to make it defensible? Uh, we've talked about a lot of different uh, evaluation matrices to be considered. There's a partial list right here. Uh, and the way we do that is HAF has developed what we call the AMP tool, the Asset Management and Prioritization Tool. We used our in-house developers to put this together, and that will help us show uh, what the answers are through weightings and priorities uh, in looking at these various factors. When we pull out the information from AMP, uh, we can then pass it on to the, the real estate tool so that uh, we can look at the return on investment and ultimately help determine the highest and best use for a, a given property. Uh, next slide. So this is our AMP tool. Uh, it's a web-based interface. It's tied into a GIS, uh, but really the power of this tool is allowing us to dynamically set weightings uh, in a collaborative setting so that everybody can put together what they think is the important piece. So across the, the bottom there, you can see several characteristics that we're looking at for properties on uh, Awesome Kingdom. Uh, in this particular example, we gave everything the same weight. Uh, we apply those and then in the upper right, you get a ranking. Uh, so uh, the first property there gets a rank of 4.17. Uh, you can see where it's located and then the attributes show you why that one happened to be ranked number one based on the, the actual data stored within the GIS. Like I said, it's a dynamic tool. Uh, in the second slide, what we're saying is, you know, percent shoreline is very critical for a particular uh, use that you're looking at. You change that weight to 50, you hit apply, you get a full uh, update on the ranking. And again, you can drill down and see what the information is there. And lastly, this third slide, uh, we switched over to cultural resources. Apply a new rank there, uh, you get a new ranking. Uh, you can pull up that information and see it. Uh, this tool, not only are you dynamically changing this, uh, you can store each of these as a scenario. Uh, so you can go back and compare uh, everybody's different viewpoints on how things should be ranked, uh, pull those up and ultimately uh, decide which is the best way to move forward uh, and considering the highest and best use for a property. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Greg. Thank you and good morning. Once a property is identified for divestment, one of the important steps that we have to take is determining the highest and best use of the property. And in doing so, we'll ask and answer four different questions. What uses are legally permissible? What's physically possible? what's financially feasible, and ultimately what use is maximally productive or most profitable. So we'll answer questions uh, and, and look at what, if any, BRA use restrictions are present, any zoning or governmental restrictions, any easement restrictions, how large is the track, what is its shape and topography, does it have any lake frontage, what is the vehicle and pedestrian access to the property, and what utilities are available to it. And based upon the answers that we get, we may end up doing a full blown or, or in-depth market or financial feasibility study uh, to answer these questions. Next slide, please. Once we know the highest and best use, we now have a roadmap. Are we looking uh, at single family residential property, large scale destination or resort development? commercial property, agricultural property, the highest and best use gives us that roadmap. We'll then research, confirm, and analyze market data. Uh, we'll employ uh, appropriate valuation approaches, which could include the cost approach, the sales comparison approach, direct capitalization approach, or discounted cash flow analysis. And then we'll report those results in a, in a report. Uh, next slide, please. In during the valuation process, we'll rely on other master plan team members. Um, we'll have discussions with market participants, and then we'll also take advantage of JLL strengths. We're a Fortune 500 full service real estate services company. We have access to brokerage, tenant representation, <coughs> property management, <coughs> excuse me, 
project delivery and construction and valuation advisory. And within that valuation advisory group, in addition to your basic property sectors, we have specialty <laughs> property sector professionals as well, including hotel and hospitality, special purpose and marina, sports and entertainment, complex real estate, and litigation and infrastructure. And additionally, we do have previous experience with BRA divestment of properties when we were operating as Integral Realty Resources. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. The seventh question uh, that you ask us to address from this presentation is to explain our h, &H modeling and historical flood assessment experience. Uh, we have a significant amount of that at Health Associates, h and &H and Water Resources. That's one of our flagship services. We've been doing that since our inception in 1950. Uh, we have extensive experience, as I mentioned earlier, working with the Brazos River Authority and throughout the Brazos River Basin on h and &H studies and historical flood assessments. We've done the modeling at Possum Kingdom, at Lake Granbury, at Lake Limestone, uh, the rivers below each of those dams, as well as the, the lower Brazos River Basin. We did a comprehensive study a few years ago. Uh, these graphics to the right are two H&H uh, &H modeling projects we've done for the BRA. Uh, the one on the, the very bottom with the, the red shading, that's actually from our Lake Granbury Flood Protection Planning Study. Uh, here in GIS, we overlaid the 100-year uh, flood elevation at Lake Granbury with the flood and flowage easements that BRA has around the reservoir just to see how those align. So uh, we're already very, already very familiar with some of the, the property assets and easements that, that BRA has. Um, additionally, we testified at the state capitol a, a couple of years ago as part of the state flood planning exercise on the hills of our lower Brazos uh, flood study. Uh, so we, we have the experience and expertise to do the H&H &H modeling and historical flood assessments. Beyond the Brazos River, we've, we've modeled in just about every single river basin in Texas. Next slide, please. Uh, we completed over 200 master drainage uh, and stormwater plans. We've been a FEMA contractor since the 1970s. We're currently on the Compass team, which is the Region 6 uh, contractor uh, for FEMA, uh, which includes the, the state of Texas. And the biggest thing we have is just bench strength. We've got 150 H and H modelers and 65 certified floodplain managers at Health Associates. Uh, as I said, this is one of our, our flagship uh, services, and so we can hit the ground running. We bring a lot of experience in this regard uh, across the state of Texas and specifically within the Brazos River Basin. Uh, questions A was a stakeholder input, and again, Health Associates has extensive. Uh, stakeholder engagement toolbox. This includes you know, project branding to interactive polling, uh, also to maybe a systematic storytelling for for uh, for the project area, as well as maybe potential for creating stream teams for this project. It's important that we establish this up front. Uh, get at the kickoff meeting, uh, get in contact with your public involvement officer. Uh, that way, we are engaged with them, uh, as, you know, understanding all the different nuances, uh, looking at. Uh, potential mail outs, uh, understanding their 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 user base uh, for the for this project. Next slide. We talked about uh, early on having a series of committee meetings, and this looks at developing a steering committee. Uh, this is uh, a, a group that could help provide guidance and input throughout the entire process, as well as developing a technical committee. Uh, this would again make sure that we're in lockstep with BRA's mission. From there, we're having vision sessions. This would include a series of vision sessions to gain input from key stakeholders, elected appointed officials, uh, also from the, from the public to determine the needs and goals of the BRA property master plan. Here we can hold uh, virtual uh, work, public workshops that are either virtual or in person. Uh, this could also be done by region or by lake. And so it's important that we establish this, this framework up, up front in the beginning. Then lastly, currently you're already using YouTube as a way to help broadcast uh, and get, get the word out. But also look at other opportunities to uh, for social media campaign to help share the mission and goal uh, for, the, for this project. One of the things we've looked at is also maybe uh, looking at developing an overall project website. Here we can be able to share this information, talk about the process, have downloadable maps uh, for, for the users, but also look at the overall schedule and overall vision uh, for, uh, for the project. We also have had the opportunity to create uh, a, a virtual uh, public engagement room. Uh, since the uh, COVID-19 has hit, 
uh, back in March, uh, we've we've had over 200 public engagement meetings utilizing this process where you're able to sign in uh, either by region or by location or by lake, uh, gather input from the public. Uh, this we put in also in English and in Spanish. And it's a great tool to help engage the citizens as well as key stakeholders throughout this process. So lastly, you know, what is the overall tool? And so what, in the end, is the final product is looking at an overall operation and maintenance assessment of your land values, looking at the cultural and natural resources of your, of your property, of properties, and also looking at the water retention along your shorelines, uh, developing a detailed implementation plan for, for, for as, as far as retainage or a divestiture for your properties, as well as setting forth regulations and policies for overall development. As we as we said throughout the entire presentation, we have a great understanding of BRA staff as well as mission and properties with all the experiences that we have worked on from uh, all the different lake properties to also the lower uh, Brazos River corridor region. Over 35 years of master planning experience, as well as a strong bench strength of 150 plus HNH modelers and 65 certified floodplain managers. We, we felt that you're creating a GIS centric toolbox that is specialized for, GIS, for, for BRA is gonna be key throughout this process, as well as having uh, a great understanding of the property evaluation analysis of JLL, as well as IES and the cultural and natural resources team. We feel that we have the best experience as well as best knowledge of BRA, and we hope to serve you guys in the future. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to back over to BRA. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, now we'd like to hear from Siglo. Hi there, this is Jonathan Ogren. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. Um, can folks see my screen, just to confirm? No. How are we doing? Can everybody yeah, see the screen? Yeah, we, yeah, I can see it. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for having us. Um, thank you to Haffen Associates for that presentation. Um, we recognize to get to today, uh, numerous people have put a lot of work into this process and we're excited to be here. Um, Brazos River Authority has a great responsibility um, and this is an exciting opportunity and we also recognize that there are a lot of things going on in the world um, that make today significant and to dedicate time to that um, this master planning process we greatly appreciate. We also think it's a very valuable process and it sets a roadmap for the future and we're excited to be part of that. Um, we want to start out with our team. You all are at the top of our team as clients and collaborators. Um, as Mr. Dixon pointed out in the initial comments uh, as we opened up this meeting, it is a broad RFP. You all are asking for numerous professional expertise. And to make that happen, we brought together a team of people that we love working with. I'm studio outside working on landscape architecture elements who have worked in in the Brazos Basin before, GAP strategies who we've worked with on numerous comprehensive plans and stakeholder processes, SWCA where we're working with conservation development ordinances and they've worked throughout the Brazos Basin and are currently a client on Allen's Creek, Doucette and Associates who have extensive work uh, experience working with river authorities um, and are very familiar with flood mitigation, water quality issues and surveying. Pros Consulting who are doing market analysis at a national international level and who are very familiar with the Texas environment. And then of course Valbridge who we've gotten to work with at um, San Antonio Edwards Aquifer Protection Program uh, looking at the assessment and appraisal of properties. Now, it's, it's important to remember that within that RFP that Mr. Dix, 
Stevenson described at the beginning, um, you all have left it open to define the scope. And we really appreciated that. And it really goes back to the idea of you all being collaborators. So you are the client, you're defining what your needs are, um, but you're also asking us to support you in that process. We also realized that as a GIS uh, information component of this project, you all hold that data and being able to work with the, the staff, stakeholders, as well as the board will be critical to having a successful project. And we are excited about that process. And we, we are clear that's what makes a good project is being able to collaborate um, with the client. Uh, for, for the last 91 years, you all have been protecting the Brazos River. Um, you've been managing the water resources, the oldest river authority in the nation. Uh, a really exciting concept. And as we think about what the centennial is for you all, um, when you turn 100, what are the projects that you want to have in the pipeline? What are the things that you all want to be looking at? And we're excited about the potential of helping you think about those elements. Um, from your strategic master plan, quality people, integrity and respect, stewardship, innovation, those, those really resonated with us. Um, that's how we brought this team together. That's what we think we are bringing to the table as well. And we think that collaboration will be significant and critical. Again, from your strategic master plan, thinking about what you all have been doing for the 100 years, Looking at these green boxes, um, these these look like they could be potentially conflicting elements, um, trying to find uh, balance financial responsibility, at, yet at the same time thinking about recreation, conservation, analysis, in-depth knowledge. What we're excited about, and as a as a team and as Siglo Group, the idea of integrating land use with natural systems, we found that using a GIS framework to make these types of decisions is critical, and we can bring disparate information together in that fashion. Uh, to the right, together we will protect water resources, improve water quality, provide habitat, and identify key locations for these elements, but also thinking about at times maybe selling off pieces of property. Again, a GIS framework will allow us to do that. And this team will allow us to think through all the elements associated with that decision. We have a extensive experience that we're gonna show you looking at geographic assessment, um, land management and policy development, and then most importantly, creating a decision-making framework for you all to move forward. Um, from the RFP process and then from the additional request from you all in bold here, these are the elements, these are the requirements that you all asked for as we check off those boxes. Um, we'll go through all of these elements and the ones highlighted are the ones that you asked us to make sure that we cover during this presentation. We'll give focus to stakeholder outreach and engagement, um, evaluating values of real properties, the evaluation of natural resources, evaluations of issues regarding endangered species, of course, flood assessment, recreational planning, protecting water quality, development of a conservation strategy. So we're gonna address those different elements through our actual process that was in the RFP um, and our proposal that we sent to you all. One, looking at project initiation, and then I'll hand it off to Kara to talk about stakeholder input. And then Mike from Studio Outside will handle planning possibilities, and then it'll come back to me for moving forward. We love GIS. Um, we love the data associated with it, and then we love taking that data and being able to make decisions from it. Um, it's a critical element uh, to making decisions when we have disparate issues associated with land use. Um, but there's also a number of considerations as we're bringing that data together. Here are some of the things that we'll be looking at. And of course, again, BRA will be a critical collaborator in that as you all hold numerous data sets that we would be interested in having. Um, with 91 years of experience, you've been collecting data for a long period of time, and that data will be crucial to making decisions about particular sites, as well as looking at the basin as a whole. 
Generally, when we start a project, and this can differentiate as we move forward, but we start looking at water resources, ecological resources, and cultural resources. And we'll show you all an example of that. These are some of the different data sets that we've used. Now, of course, many times, and depending on the project, we may split up those cultural resources to look specifically at transportation or to look at the potential of development or uh, potential of return on a property. Um, and in water resources, we may break out elements associated with flooding, flood mitigation, or flood hazards. Uh, but in general, we can bring together multiple data sets that are hard to compare in a GIS framework. And I'd like to show you uh, a couple ways that we think about that. First, we can look at the statewide elements or areas outside the basin that we need to consider when thinking about properties within the basin, understanding the, the complexity of the ecoregions, basic elements that, that we are unable to change, things like weather, geography, geology, that are influencing decisions that'll happen within the Brazos. And of course, the watershed itself, which you all have done a great deal of studying, looking at where that rain falls and the implications of those raindrops. Of course, there's basin transfers associated with that. And then the mystical groundwater, its impacts on your water availability um, and impacts on And then we go on to uh, the way we're using the landscape, the complexity of the land use associated with that. Urban sprawl, which while the Brazos Basin has had some impacts from urban sprawl compared to other basins in the state, not as many, but as you all know, that population is increasing over time. As a result of that, there are impaired waterways, things that you all will need to think about as you're moving forward and you're managing the water resources within the basin. One solution that we, we have been intimately involved with and we think is critical and points to one of the things that you all request us talking about is conservation within the basin. There's numerous strategies that are working in the state and some of them are actually fit to the Texas mentality with a state that only has about 5% of its lands in public holdings and only about 2% of those hands in some kind of natural resource or conservation management. It's critical to think about long-term as these additional populations come to the basin, how the ecosystem services, the natural services of the landscape are being maintained in perpetuity. Uh, we've worked extensively with the Texas Land Trust Council, which is a consortium of approximately 32 land trusts throughout the state and they use the conservation easement tool um, for a majority of their properties. And over the last 40 years, as a result of the land trust community and the Texas Land Trust Council, approximately 1% of the state is now in some form of conservation easement. This is a critical element in a state that prides itself on uh, having private land holdings, but also is interested in the preservation of those open spaces through throughout the state. And we think that is a tool that can work effectively in the Brazos Basin. Moving to that point, an example of a project that we've used where we're using GIS modeling data and thinking about how we make decisions. We've worked extensively with the city of San Antonio and the San Antonio Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. Over a 1 million acre, over uh, almost a decade now, to help protect 150,000 acres of land uh, through a stakeholder process that was driven by a scientific evaluation team. We worked with them ongoing to develop a model that had elements associated with water resources, biological resources, parcel size, and adjacency to open space to define and understand the best way for them to use the $200 million that they have spent thus far on conservation lands within this million acre area. So about 20% with partner organizations, about 20% of the study area has been put into some type of protection with most of that area being in conservation easements because it is a financially viable way to work with landowners that get to stay on their land 
and protect those natural resources that are coming to the city of San Antonio, the seventh largest city in the country, one of the largest cities in the world whose primary source of drinking water is groundwater. And so we know we can bring the same type of tool to understanding properties within the Brazos Basin. This kind of information also translates to the site level where we can bring that GIS information to understand elements like significant uh, uh, species, critical environmental features, tree canopy, to understand how best to utilize a site. And here, this example, we're looking at a retreat center on Lake Austin that, that will allow teachers to come out on a regular basis. Uh, and it will also be used um, for, for weddings and other elements. And it is a, it's an opportunity for them to explore the natural environment uh, with Lake Austin right there as a beautiful uh, background. Um, and we know we can do the same thing with BRA properties. And of course, Siglo Group alone would not do this project. There are many elements that you all are requesting and we're excited about collaboration. As a small business in Texas, um, we recognize that the only way that we can do work, good work, is to collaborate with great uh, other organizations. In SWCA, we've had the opportunity to work with in Hayes County and on other conservation projects, and we're excited to have them here to walk you all through endangered species issues. Um, that assessment begins with looking at databases, understanding previous documentation, as needed going out on the site and doing surveys, evaluating any modifications to those landscapes, and then of course long-term monitoring, which they are already doing for you all on some properties. Cultural resources, again, a similar process, looking at those databases, evaluating the probability of those resources on the particular sites that we're looking at, and then coordinating with appropriate agencies. And then mitigation banks, that's something that you all asked us to address as well. So what we'll do is assess baseline conditions, determine if there is a market for that mitigation bank, understand the functional value of those resources on that particular property, make sure, validate that those resources are on the property and understand how many credits would be available on that property. And then of course, coordinating and negotiating with the appropriate agencies as th that process moves forward. An example of this is the Lower Bodark Creek Reservoir where mitigations were done for a reservoir. SWCA led this process. They took a watershed approach, understood the system as a whole, documented existing conditions, came up with a restoration plan. And as a result of that, they have restored over 80 miles and 9,000 acres of wetland. This is something we can bring to the Brazos Basin. Um, this is something that SWCA has done throughout the Brazos Basin. Allen Creek Reservoir, currently SWCA, is working with you all on this project, beginning with endangered species assessment and eventually moving to wetland delineation. Process so far is baseline data collection and then also looking at cultural resources. Again, understanding that permit process, um, the resources that are available and helping BRA move forward their mission With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Hegemeyer with Doucette and Associates. Tom is someone I've gotten to work with for the last 15 years when he was at LCRA. He brings extensive engineering experience. He is a, um, a great person to work with, and he has that understanding of how river authorities work. So with that, Tom. Thanks, Jonathan, and good morning, everybody. Doucette and Associates has been in business for about 30 years and has staff with decades of experience doing floodplain planning, modeling, and also flood mitigation. Uh, we, and we've done that work across the state. Uh, from that experience, uh, we think in this project initiation phase, it's good to assess historical flood levels. And that's from getting all the great data you already have, the maps and the models, and working with BRA staff. 
because uh, we see y'all because we see us as, as as an extension of your staff and y'all know it and, and y'all know the system the best We've, we would work closely with you to get that information then have that applied to your properties also looking at that urbanization and how it may change future flooding we, we would consider those elevations and also floodplains on on those properties and how it might affect your reservoirs and their operations from my experience at lcra up on the highland lakes it's important to look at wave damage from all the wake surfing boats and other activities and also to protect those properties and assets. So, so we developed a, uh, it's a lakeshore guide for residents to, to, uh, to do all the right techniques. They can uh, uh, have some good measures that also protect their property and can provide habitat. Next slide. From that process at the watershed scale, we can then hone in on the site scale and then use those models and maps to look at how different land scenarios might impact your property or those downstream. If there are some impacts, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of tools that can be used. One is stormwater detention basins. It's a real common practice in Texas uh, where you can uh, have those floods controlled on your property. They should be multi-use and purpose. They could be ball fields, recreation areas. So I think detention ponds can, can be more than just a flood control mitigation technique, but also uh, help in other ways. Uh, one more avenue is taking low impact development. It's a way to shoehorn in different types. Hey, Tom, Tom we've lost your audio. Okay, sorry about that. For some reason, it's, it did switch off. When did y'all lose my audio? Let's let's say 30 seconds to a minute ago. You were talking okay. about low impact development, Tom. OK, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, so low impact development is another tool besides detention. You can shoehorn in some stormwater measures within your development, such as rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, porous pavement to manage stormwater at the source uh, that can help uh, shrink your stormwater footprint and allow for more land to be developed uh, in, in the appropriate locations on, on a site. And that ties to natural area protection and we would work with our team and the GIS specialist and also the ecologist to identify those lands that are good for stormwater management. And we, 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 we like to apply the five S's approach in stormwater to uh, slow it and then spread it and then soak it and sink it and save it. We see stormwater as a resource for you all and also your properties and also the entire basin. Next slide. And that stormwater resource ties into water quality protection. We could use some of the same models and tools and practices for an efficient process to, to look at water quality. At the same time, you're thinking about floodplain mitigation. Some tools are conservation development, where large chunks of land are preserved and then not developed, and they can provide a stormwater resource or could be a parkland and yet also focus development in other parts of your property that are less environmentally sensitive. Uh, when I was at LCRA, we would craft some policies and criteria for LCRA lands, often based upon the Highland Lakes Watershed Ordinance. So those guidances and criteria were uh, used then with developers and engineers in the contract negotiation process for leases or purchases to be clear on what could be done and how it's done to make for a pretty uh, nice and smooth contracting process as you look at doing different aspects with your land. With that, I'll hand it back to Jonathan. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, and now I'm gonna ask Kara to present on stakeholder input. Kara is with Gap Strategies, a principal there and an owner. Um, she's someone we've gotten to work with extensively, extensively on comprehensive plans. And we're currently working with Tom on conservation ordinances for a uh, rural to urban county, Hayes County, here in Central Texas. Kara? And I'm hoping Kara's, Kara said she had actually been kicked out a couple times. Kara? Well, I'll tell you what, as, um, we cannot hear her currently. I'm gonna start walking through this process. Um, so 
so one of the things that that Kara is clear on um, is that she likes having all these technical folks on her team, but she wants to make sure we're hearing the voices, the people that are going to be impacted by the project. Hey, Kara, can you mic? Yes, Kara. Hey, sorry about that. I like to give you a little bit of a surprise. I apologize uh, for that. Um, I'll take over from here, Jonathan. Great, great. Um, again, my name is Kara Buffington. I'm a partner in Gap Strategies. Uh, like Jonathan said, we've worked with Siglo and Jonathan and other members of this team on lots of projects over the last eight years or so. Our firm specializes in public engagement and stakeholder input that's easy, innovative, collaborative, and that informs all decisions and aspects of the project. As you've seen, we've got a team with great technical experience and capability and as a non-technical person myself, I can brag on them and say that they're really some of the best of the best in the state. But what turns a great technical planning process into an actionable plan is stakeholder input that goes through every step of the process. Like this slide references, we like to use a multi-channeled approach because we really firmly believe that public and stakeholder engagement isn't one size fits all. Next slide. As you can see on this slide, these are the types of stakeholders we'd like to consider including. But we'll first meet with you or a staff designee to determine a list of tiered stakeholders because we recognize that as smart as you are, you're the on the ground experts on this diverse region. Once we identify those key, st st key stakeholders, rather, we'll talk through with you how to best reach out to them. Typically, we recommend at least four stakeholder meetings at specific intervals. These meetings help us gain insight and institutional knowledge. They help us understand preferences. They help us create shared vision and goals. And they help us evaluate the impacts of land use decisions. Like I said, we often recommend at least four meetings. If selected, we'll further define this in conversation with y'all. But here's how a typical set of stakeholder meetings might look. Number one, a kickoff meeting to set the stage for the entire plan, create a shared vocabulary, and start outlining goals. Number two, a meeting after research and initial findings to begin to gather input and refine those goals. Number three, a stakeholder, a design charrette to determine a path forward toward a final plan. And number four, a review of a draft final product. In addition to these meetings with key or as I like to call them tier one stakeholders, we know that good planning comes from broader public outreach so we intend to use a project website as well as a robust social media campaign to engage your communities. Next slide. As we all know, COVID has changed the landscape and presents some challenges for agencies and governmental entities seeking public feedback or participation. And the GAP team has become leaders in this area. We've run incredibly successful public engagement programs virtually across the state during COVID. This virtual outreach can look like Facebook or YouTube live events, text in campaigns that walk the public through short surveys, or virtual town hall meetings with interactive exercises that can be accessed from your smartphone while sitting on your couch. In these meetings, whether for a large group of stakeholders or a small one, we can have voting via cell phones with real time results and other interactive input activities designed to give us critical data to chart the path forward. All of these virtual activities are designed to be above all easy to use and participate in. Not only are they designed with a non-tech savvy person in mind, they'll be, be available in English and Spanish, as well as be accessible for those with disabilities like vision impairments or people who require the use of assistive technologies. In addition to doing this, um, I'm sorry, instead of in-house, Siglo has brought experts in the field of public engagement to the team. Thank you. Um, on this slide here are just a few recent projects we've worked on and two of these projects are with some of the members of this team. These projects represent a snippet of the work we've done in the last several months where we've employed some of these techniques I've talked about with fantastic results, all of those during this time of COVID. Each of these projects looks, looks different and we've used different customized set of tools each time, but in every instance, we've actually had better, more robust engagement than if we relied on in-person engagement alone. Lots and lots of firms rely on engagement software that walks you through a virtual town hall, but we're really passionate about crafting tailored solutions to each client using multiple platforms based on conversations and input from the client at the very start. And I can't wait to start that conversation with y'all. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks, and thanks for the patience with my microphone mishap. Thank you, Kara. So um, as we end uh, the stakeholder input, we're gonna let Mike Fraze from Studio Outside transition us from that and then jump into the planning component of our project. Uh, Mike is a principal at Studio Outside. Studio Outside has done extensive work, some of that within the basin and has some great projects to share with you and their relevance to BRA. Uh, and with that, Mike, I'll hand it over to you. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. That, that's rarely ever an issue with me, so uh, I feel pretty good. Even if my mic went out, I think you guys could probably still hear me down there. Um, well, I, I wanted to kind of tie in just a little bit with uh, what Kara was speaking about, because I think that is such a vital, vital component to a successful plan. Um, and in addition to the, the stakeholder engagement, one of the things that we always look at as a design firm is also engaging with our clients. Uh, we always kind of say that we're, uh, we're not ta-da designers where we'll meet with you, go away to our office, and then come back with a plan and say, ta-da, here's the plan. We're more aha designers where we want to collaborate with the team. We want to collaborate with the stakeholders. We want to collaborate with our clients and collectively have that aha moment of here's how we do it, here's how we approach it. And one of those tools that we use within that that we would be working closely with Kara on is what we call our discovery workshop that we would do with the client team. Um, it's a way for us to start to really understand your mission more than the surface level and to start to draw goals and metrics that will come from that that actually become the facets combined with the stakeholder input that really drive the plan. They're not just a foundational element that we, we have a list of stuff and we try to respond to. They're going to be the metrics that will test every design idea, every concept, every process that we bring forward to you. We'll go through that to make sure that the plan and the master plan that we develop is really from those missions and really from those goals and really responsive to those, all the way down to phasing and priorities. This is a component that really drives um, the backbone of our, our planning work. Um, let's go to the next slide. So when we talk about planning work um, and our next steps, I think uh, Jonathan and the team have done a great job about talking about project initiation and how we start to look at those resources and really give the land a voice in the process. And Kara has done a, an excellent job of talking about the stakeholder input and listening to the people that we're trying to serve. And that's a vast, vast audience with a vast, vast series of perspectives and priorities, right? Those two components. So where do we go with that information and how do we build from that? Um, let's go to the next slide. Well, one of the, the next steps uh, we do is that we actually have two other team members that we work very closely with, uh, one of which is Pros Consulting, which we've got a, a history of working uh, with this company throughout, uh, throughout the years and across the country on various efforts. Um, they're an international expert on, uh, on basically a market analysis and park planning. What they will do with our team is help us understand um, the needs that are associated with the region, recreational and regional needs. They'll help us understand the trends that are happening in the market. And more importantly, they're going to help us identify the gaps that are existing in the market. So as we start to look at a plan, we're going to look at a plan from a holistic level and not just respond to those people that we already have connections with, but also create portals, if you will, and opportunities for those that haven't had the chance to engage and understand BRA's uh, mission, an opportunity for them to kind of come into the fold and become a part of the bigger picture. Um, the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Valbridge and looking at property valuation. Um, you know, when we look at these portfolio uh, plans and look at all these multiple sites, I mean, obviously there's cost, there's um, the market value of the land, there's appraisal of the land, there's also the understanding of, of how we use all the land and which ones do we focus on and are there some that we don't focus on. And that whole collection of that evaluation process, uh, Valbridge will be critical in that working with our team, informing us, informing the client so that we, we have those pieces to build from. Um, let's go to the next slide. So when we take all this information, when we take all of the project initiation and letting the land speak to us, 
And when we understand what our stakeholders and what BRA is trying to accomplish, the people, who are we trying to serve? Those that have actually engaged in the process and those that haven't been able to engage in the process. And then understanding the programs that are out there that we know we want to provide and those that maybe aren't provided in the marketplace today that can become portal moments. What we feel is, is critical from a design standpoint is to approach this work with a whole system philosophy. This is, this is the backbone of our work. This is how we approach all the work. It's all about story, but more importantly, it's about experience and how we deal with the resources, the people, and the programs, that composite, how they all come together, are absolutely critical in creating very meaningful and transformative experiences. I like to say that our job is really, we're not the show, we're the set designer. The pieces that we use in our landscape, the pieces that we use in our planning, set the stage for the show, which are the people that actually come to the site, engage with the site, build a stronger relationship with those properties, and ideally build a stronger relationship with BRA and BRA's mission so that they can become stewards in the future. That's the show. And if we look at all three of these pillars that our team has already talked about today, resources, people, and programming, those are the components that really go into that. And there's subsets to all of those, right? Resources isn't just nature. It's also the economics, um, you know, understanding how these things are going to perform and how they're going to work together. Let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. I've got a few uh, project examples, one of which was actually referenced nice enough by Dean in the prior presentation, actually two of which, um, Cook County uh, Forest Preserve District Master Plan, and actually even Galveston Island State Park was a project that we did with him as well. All tied to story, all talking about the land, and obviously all talking about engaging a very diverse group of people in a variety of different ways. Um, and understanding that it wasn't just about the resource, we needed to understand how these things operated. With Galveston Island State Park, we had to design that entire park for three and a half staff. That was our number we had to work with to make sure that that park could operate under three and a half staff. With Cook County, which is up on your screen today, this was a project that we did with the Forest Preserve District. It covered over 70,000 acres of land, over 350 sites, where they were actually looking at putting in a camping master plan throughout all of their properties. And this went from very, very urban areas in Chicago to very, very rural areas or suburban areas like Calumet City and Deerfield and areas like that that are in the outskirts of the county outside of the city. What we did, though, was that we built this plan, and we did all of these through discovery sessions, built this plan around the Forest Preserve District's mission. And so every opportunity that somebody engaged with the land was also an opportunity to learn more about their mission and to actually want to explore more about the Forest Preserve District and their land holdings. For Cook County, it was all about water. It was all about movement of water. Uh, all of the sites were organized around um, waterways that ran through the city, and it became a very progressive experience so that each site told a part of a, of a bigger story. Each site was a chapter in the bigger book about the land holdings, and so one person could actually go and travel from site to site to site and actually build a holistic experience of different experiences from some of these different sites, and that's one of the things that we'll want to look at with your properties is to understand that overarching story that holds it together and then how each site can play a role within that narrative. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, we've actually had um, the, the great fortune to work with I think five of the six Girl Scout councils um, in Texas reorganizing their portfolio master plans um, and looking at their sites and understanding how their sites, one, operate uh, to how they provide immersive programming to uh, to an obviously an evolving market. The girls that were in their program 15, 20 years ago are looking are not the same girls that are in their program now. And so the Girl Scouts needed to learn to pivot within their portfolio master plan. This is a project that we did. I'm actually showing two of the councils here, Northeast Texas and Oklahoma Plains. So those cover Dallas and Fort Worth. And one of the things that we worked with them about was to actually celebrate the nuances and the diversities within their sites within a larger story. And so what we actually looked at was with all of the sites, each site became what we called a center of excellence. It was a, a site that celebrated 
the High Plains. There was a site that celebrated the Cross Timbers or the Blackland Prairie. They all were part of a network that talked about the echo regions of Texas. And what it did was it built this, fostered this desire of progressiveness where each girl wanted to go to each site as opposed to I'm only going to one site. This also translated into programs. So that each side actually highlighted different aspects of program. One was uh, equestrian based, one was high adventure based, one was water based. So understanding how program plays a role within your planning vision is absolutely critical. For the Girl Scouts, what it also did was it expanded the programming opportunities that they were able to provide, but it actually reduced their operating and management costs because they didn't have to do 10 equestrian programs on 10 different sites. They did one on one side and made it amazing. Let's go to the, the next slide. And so this is our last study, and I, hopefully you can kind of see how we take it from a big scale down to a smaller scale. This is Camp Lajita. This is a actual site that we did um, for the Girl Scouts of Southwest Texas, one of the projects that uh, we did out of their portfolio master plan. Um, what was interesting was Camp Lajita was all about the Sabine River. Um, and when we came to it, Camp Lajita was not about the Sabine River. It actually kind of turned its back on it. But we reorganized this property master plan and embraced what were things that at the time might have been seen as challenges to become opportunities, like the amount of floodplain that they had. That image in the lower right there, we actually purposely located uh, facilities such as their cabin right at the edge of the floodplain so that the girls could see how that land transformed and how those systems and events, what they really meant. The, the cabins themselves became kind of a barometer because they were up on piers and they could actually see the water lines on those piers and understand that this land that I'm standing on today that's dry in a major event is under two or three feet of water. It's simple little things like that of just how we use our programming to tell a much deeper story. And that's one of the things that we would really look at doing with DRA is to understand how we put programming in, but how can we do it in, in a bigger way? One, one of my big words I always like to say or phrase is, is duality of the dollar. And I feel strongly about this. You cannot spend a dollar on any site and it does one task. If we do a parking lot, a parking lot needs to have a bioswill or it needs to be done in a way where it can talk about stormwater management or how we catch water uh, running through the site. The same is true with any other facility. There should be multiple storylines that you're able to provide within your property. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually hand it back to Jonathan here and uh, go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so these three elements that we've discussed in detail bring us to moving forward. And that's really where we need to collaborate with you all to define the path forward. We're going to show you something about how you determine operational necessity, as well as challenges we're seeing. But we're very interested and excited about the collaboration with BRA. And we recognize that a master planning process, it starts with data, but that conversation with you all as key stakeholders, key folks who have knowledge about the process, and then understanding what is feasible through the planning possibilities is critical. So just determining operational necessity. What is your mission and what do you all need to do? You need to manage the water resources of the entire basin. Um, are the are the properties aligned with your mission, your long term vision or your responsibilities? Understanding those resources, again, going back to the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, um, cultural resources and understanding the cost. What does it mean from a market perspective or an actual value of property perspective for you all to retain and improve a piece of property or to sell a piece of property? What are the regulations associated with a particular property? Um, what could you do with that property in the future? What does it mean to you all from some of your long term goals if you're thinking about what you would like to see when you turn 200? Um, and then the stakeholder perspective. You have constituencies out there that you're working with on a regular basis. How important are particular properties to them as well? And again, determining that operational necessity, this lays out some of the elements, but it will be a conversation with staff and stakeholders to understand what operational necessity is to you all. And it, again, Mr. Dixon's description of this RFP and our proposal understands that this is a complex 
set of ideas that you all are looking at within this project. Uh, and there will be challenges. But if you look at the bubbles that are the solutions, numerous talk about the collaboration and communication. So the dynamism, uh, we've got climate change, we've got drought, um, we've got changing populations. So really having an adaptive approach to any plans that you're making and plan for that change to happen. Unmet expectations within the project, us again, working with you all, collaborating, defining the goals of each distinct portion of the project, creating timelines that are realistic and creating task oriented elements for us to work on and to collaborate with you all on. Attrition, one of the main elements that we have within this team is shared skill sets. And we've done numerous of these projects together. We know how to work with each other. We know how to collaborate with each other. We're excited about the collaboration with you all. Our understanding from SWCA is that you all like collaborating with your consultants and we're excited about that process. And of course, we're value driven. This work means a lot to us and we're excited about being able to work on it with you. Miscommunication, again, collaboration is there. One of the things that we found on large projects like this is to have a standing meeting. That meeting may only last five minutes on some weeks because not much is happening or we're in detail on a particular element, but those standing meetings mean regular communication and it allows us to make sure that we're meeting your expectations and it allows us to make sure that we're moving forward. And then lack of data. This is always a problem with GIS projects. Anybody who has worked with GIS understands this, but we've done it on numerous projects. So it's again, understanding those ex expectations, adapting to what is feasible, and then planning for the future. There may be data points that are critical for BRA that we don't currently have current now, but we can look a decade forward and make sure that data is in your hands. So I'd like to end with just a summary looking at the scales of analysis as we understand that to be critical to this element and to be critical to a GIS framework for making decisions. We've looked at the Brazos Basin for conservation priorities in the past, taking in numerous variables, uh, er numerous other team members, studio outside, gap strategies have looked at this basin-wide evaluation as Doucette has to understand different elements. So we can look at the basin level, we can look at the region level to understand, say, conservation priorities in a particular area. Um, right here, the conservation agenda for the Guadalupe Basin, we worked with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department through a stakeholder process and a GIS database modeling procedural model to determine the conservation agenda for the Guadalupe Basin. Uh, we've worked with the city of Austin to understand green infrastructure throughout their city limits and ETJ. We've worked with Hill Country Alliance, Hill Country Conservancy to understand conservation priorities and ish gaps in conservation throughout the Hill Country. And then going down to the site level, much of what Mike talked about from studio outside, what pros brings together, uh, we can start looking at those sites, doing master plans, doing site assessments with SWCA to create fulfilling, engaging, important experiences at the site level that are also ecologically significant and work towards the mission of BRA. Finally, why would you all choose us? You can see that we're a number of people that are excited about the type of work that you all are doing. We like working together. It turns out that everybody on this call, I've had incredible experiences with, and I respect them as professionals. <coughs> we're excited about doing that with BRA. We have a systems focus. We don't only under, understand GIS. We don't only understand planning, but we understand all those pieces need to come together to make important projects for the Brazos River Authority. We'll have senior level involvement. You have principals, senior level staff on this call, and throughout the process, we will be communicating with you and managing this process. And we wanna create legacy visionary solutions for you all as you're looking to your centennial in nine years and thinking about what you would like to see in 200 years. 
The last one I'll mention is we're innovative. We love working on projects like this, and there's all kinds of opportunities where we can support new and interesting solutions to the ideas that you all have. With that, I'll say thank you and turn it back over to BRA. Thank you very much to both teams. Those are excellent presentations. We'll now open up the meeting for the committee to direct their questions to these firms. I ask that the committee members alternate the order of questions to the firms. In other words, if your first question goes to half, and then Siglo, the second question should go to Siglo first, and then half. And we'll continue alternating the order with each new question. With that, I'll open the floor uh, to the committee members. Are there uh, are there questions you'd like to ask of either team? Good morning, Jim. This is uh, Mike Fernandez, uh, part of the uh, Property Management Committee. Yes, sir. And, uh, I do have a question, and for for both firms actually, uh, and we'll we'll start with Jonathan. Uh, but the question is the same for for both firms. And that is what what will be the actual deliverable uh, to the BRA? I know we're talking about a, a master plan, but what what will be handed off uh, to the BRA? That's a great question, Mr. Fernandez. Thank you for that. So within the the RFP that you all put out, that is something that is to be negotiated with the team that is chosen. But I will give you a hypothetical of what that would look like. So one, one element that seems critical as we're sitting here, but again, that's a collaboration or a negotiation or a discussion with you all, is a database, understanding your basin, understanding your properties, and there'll be critical resources that you wanna be tracking at each of those properties. So putting together that GIS database sounds like a clear request from the proposal, the RFP that you all put out. But then understanding how that translates down to a specific site is something that we'll need to be talking about. And so I could see it easily moving to a site-specific evaluation of a particular property, say on Possum Kingdom. And so we might be looking at a master planning process at a particular property on Possum Kingdom where we would get Kara involved with the stakeholder process. We would have Tom involved with the uh, any flood issues or any water quality issues that might happen on that particular property. We would have Mike involved with the programmatic elements. We would have pros and Valbridge associated with market analysis in the appraisal of the property. You may be choosing between two particular properties and understanding which to develop and which to sell off. And then we would create a long-term land management plan for that property. That's something that we've done on numerous projects. We would work uh, collaboratively with SWCA to understand what the current state of that property is, how it can be restored, are there endangered species concerns, are there cultural resource concerns, and how do we heighten the ecological health of that property while enhancing the water quality coming off of that property. And that management project is a task-oriented document that's a lead behind for the land managers. And we've actually worked with those land managers over multiple years after completing that process to make sure that they're having success. And so whatever we're doing with you all, we want to make sure we're task-oriented and we have metrics of success moving forward. But again, specifically to answer your question, within the RFP process, that's something that you all have laid out as something that we will discuss and collaborate with you all to define over time. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is again, this is Lenny Hughes of Half Associates. And also, uh, this goes back to the February 24th meeting, pre-proposal meeting that we had at BRA. And looking at the all the different properties that, that BRA had in their land holdings from uh, lease agreements to uh, actual uh, real property. And so it's important that we have established a strong GIS-based approach, uh, as, as others have said, but also having a tool that staff members, uh, that managers, as well as the uh, different operators can use on a day-to-day on -day basis. And so having this, this uh, toolbox that is customizable to their, to, their, to their use. We talk about this asset management tool, and I think that is, again, could be the first 
um, uh, thing that we look at from the evaluation matrix and uh, going back to the areas around possum kingdom where we look at the linear footage of shoreline adjacent land uses are we areas of uh, threatened and endangered species uh, looking also at the, looking at the vegetative qualities so this tool we'll use to help start to establish the framework and we will work with staff uh, to associate and establish the, the different priorities with that, as well as associating and developing a valuation as part of this overall tool. There we look at the real estate values and we work with JLL on their previous experience and knowledge of, of, P, of PK and the work that they've done there and work collectively to help, uh, again, st establish that framework for the overall development. Well, a lot of things we've talked about before, you know, what is the, the overall outcome? And, and what type of uh, tangible items that we would have as far as the overall development. Half Associates, we've been uh, working with other or large organizations such as LCRI, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Opportunity, as well as BRA, and establishing guidelines and assessments tools to help them make day-to-day -day decisions on their properties. We would collectively work together to, uh, again, establish that framework as far as the overall deliverables, but also having something that's tangible that they look at and use on a day-to-day -day basis. As mentioned before, the engagement process is, is going to be critical. And so we would work together collectively to establish the tool that, that best fits your needs and as far as getting able to get the word out to uh, your different constituents. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you very much. Other questions from the committee? Director Lattimore, I have a question, please. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. I thank you very much for your presentations. Um, very informative. I feel like there's um, an elephant in the room the BRA owns an airport on Possum Kingdom. Can both of you address actual uh, business uh, on the properties and what your approach would be to um, addressing that? We can start with half, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we were actually, when we made several site visits to all your, your several of your lakes, including uh, Granberry as well as um, uh, Possum Kingdom, and we were able to actually go out to the site and visit that property, uh, which is on the, uh, on the again, next to adjacent to uh, some residential development uh, for, the, um, for the airport. So as part of this process, we'll look at, um, you know, what are the, the uses, what is the long, short and long-term use of that airport, how is it being utilized today, uh, right now? Uh, what is the importance of that? How is it being used by BRA and, and, and other areas of other um, entities within that region? And so this would start to set forth a framework as far as uh, guiding us to know, is this land uh, important or is there a higher and best use for this, this property? Um, and this is Jonathan Ogren at Sigla Group. Uh, Michael at Pros um, is, is one of the people that we would have address that. Um, first, highest and best use, we would look at all parameters. And again, go, going back to those cultural resources, um, you all have numerous opportunities. Uh, the example that we showed on Lake Austin, um, it, it, is, it is going to be a moneymaker for that organization at the same time it's set within a park setting and allows for uh, water quality protections it has green infrastructure infrastructure integrated throughout the design and it allows for park planning process so what we are going to be looking for are win-win opportunities uh, allowing you all your fiduciary responsibility your fiscal responsibility to make sure that you're managing your assets appropriately um, from a business perspective, but also recognizing uh, the, the natural infrastructure that you all are responsible for protecting long-term within the, the Brazos Basin and the value associated with that. Going back to the city of San Antonio example, they recognize that 
$200 million, which sounds like a lot of money on this phone call, is a drop in the bucket compared to the, the amount of dollars that they're using to pipe water to make sure that they don't have uh, water shortage supplies. Uh, and I'm wondering if Mike, um, either from pros or from studio outside would also like to comment on that question. This is Mike from uh, Pros Consulting. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to answer this specific question. Uh, I think first and foremost, it, it does come uh, with uh, Volbridge's um, uh, you know, land valuation um, and really understanding the, the appraisal and, and value of that property in such a way um, that uh, determines what what land use uh, or what the compatible land uses are associated with that site. Um, and, and this can range anything from, from parks and recreation to uh, lodging, restaurants, um, some sort of mixed use development. Uh, but through our uh, varied and complex uh, market analysis tools, uh, we would ultimately develop what would be called a, a compatibility matrix um, to really understand the, the potential opportunities of that site uh, could be also in addition to um, you know, such things as parks and recreation, it could be to to energy sources. Um, would it be best suited for, quote unquote, a solar farm, um, as an example? So uh, ultimately, uh, through our analysis and our evaluation, uh, we would determine the highest, best uses of property um, and develop a compatibility matrix for you um, as a as a as a starting point um, to determine the, the future utilization of that site. This, this is Mike here at Studio Outside. I'll just uh, be brief and add to that. I think in addition to the best uses for that site, and, and honestly, we have worked in, in all different types of sites with all different types of endeavors uh, from Echo Region resorts all the way through. So we're, we're very comfortable in working with those. But I do think one critical piece with the, um, the airport discussion is – what it is today and what it is forecast to be within the ultimate master plan, there's also an interim step that has to be thought about of how we get from today to that, that future plan. And I think those are critical components in any plan, not just with that airport, but all the land is how do we make those steps to transition to our ultimate vision? Um, because sometimes when you have that vision and then you have today, you need that roadmap to kind of connect those two so you know how to get there. So that's a piece that would also be in that thought process is if we do pivot, how do we pivot over the years to get to where we want to be ultimately? Thank you very much. Other questions from the committee members? I would, uh, I would pose one, I guess, uh, should go to Siglo first. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about the uh, development of this database, and it sounds to me like it's really a two-stage process. One would be gathering all of the information, and then the second one would be an, an implementation. Can you talk a little bit about how much BRA staff involvement there would be? How much are you going to depend on, on our people to produce information, and how much are you going to generate yourselves? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, one of the beauties, we we hear a lot, this is Jonathan at Sigla Group, we hear a lot about big data today. And it turns out that the where big data really is started is within GIS. It's taking any type of element and putting a location marker on top of it. And so you can think about how we're telling where we are on our cell phone. You can think about LIDAR data, which is just an elevation point with a lat and a long. And we've got these large computational uh, uh, needs associated with GIS data. Thankfully, um, we have been collecting GIS data and there are a number of uh, public open source databases um, that fit um, that, that uh, cover the Brazos River watershed, Brazos River Basin. That said, there may be particular elements that you all are interested in that you all don't have 
or that are not currently available. So that again is where we'll need to make sure that we're meeting, we're setting expectations and understanding that there will be some elements that we will track or begin to get data over time. That'll, that'll be particularly important when we're looking at a specific site and understanding say something like endangered species on a particular site where we believe they are known to occur. And so then we'll bring in SWCA. It could also be that we are looking at high resolution evaluation of plant communities on a site. Again, we would need to go out there. Now your question was, how much are we relying on BRA staff? So we've done projects like this all over the state, um, throughout the Rio Grande Basin, up into New Mexico and Colorado. And it really depends on what data is available and what are the expectations of the project. So again, we'll be collaborating with you all. We have enough data within our databases currently to begin the master planning process. That said, I would guess that you all have some unique data sets and you have staff that are likely eager to make sure that we're using that data to make a better product. And so we're excited again about collaborating with you all, communicating with you all to get that information into any type of planning process that we do and eventually implementing on the ground changes. Thank you. Jeff? Hi, good morning. It's Lenny Hughes again. I'm going to pass this on to Russell Marshak and also to Aaron uh, Atkinson. Uh, yes, to, uh, thank you. To focus on the you know two parts that I, I pulled out of that question was the development of the database and the reliance on the BRA staff. Um, I think you know you heard in both presentations there's a lot of information that is out there that's publicly available. Uh, you know that's our business. You know as as GIS professionals, we're used to managing that data, working with that data on assortment of projects. So, you know, we already have a fundamental understanding of how we think, you know, a, a GIS database should begin. But at the same time, from, you know, just our experience with BRA, uh, from our, um, you know, the, the pre-proposal meeting, you know, we're aware that BRA is going to have a lot of information that, uh, you know, may be beneficial for us, you know, setting that up and actually being an integral component of what we ultimately develop. Uh, so, you know, you know, to kind of build on that theme, yes, we, we're going to rely on our expertise to develop that data, and uh, then we're also going to, you know, work with BRA with the information they have, and then, you know, just every project is ultimately going to involve some boots on the ground. As far as, uh, you know, reliance and input from BRA staff, um, you know, it was expressed in the pre-proposal meeting that they ultimately want some type of tool that's delivered. So I think there's an expectation from half that uh, BRA is excited to be part of this process. Uh, I'm going to let Aaron Atkinson kind of, you know, help on this, you know, answer as he can kind of talk, you know, elaborate a little bit more on what he presented in terms of uh, how we provide that deliverable to a client, how you know, the training for that project goes, and then, you know, the, the types of staff that are ultimately working, uh, our clients, their staff, how they're ultimately working with that product. All right, thank you, Russell. Uh, so I, I really do see this as two uh, kind of buckets of activity, the, the data collection. Um, obviously, uh, half will, you know, take a, a large part of the burden by, you know, if you have a literally a box of information that needs to go in, we'll use our uh, folks to actually enter that data. Uh, but there's another part of this application that actually allows for self-service capabilities. So some data slowly comes in, uh, it's uh, updated information, and we're going to provide the BRA staff the ability to enter that information as it comes in over time. I mentioned the application. Uh, that is a uh, critical piece of working with staff to understand what that application needs to be. What are the capabilities? Uh, we, we currently host about 50 custom applications for various clients, and those applications are specifically designed for each client, for each situation. And when we do that, we do work through a lot of staff engagement to understand their needs and their capabilities. Finally, once we have the, the application built for the project, 
uh, we expect this to go on over time beyond the life of this particular project so that uh, BRA staff can continue to use that. We'll work with staff to understand, do they want to host this themselves? Do they want to use their existing uh, ESRI, RGS organizational environment? Or do they want to move towards uh, a hybrid scenario? Or would they like to have to continue to host it? We have those capabilities and we do want to very much engage BRA staff to understand how that ultimate deliverable uh, is best used and how they want to see it moving into the future. This is Kirk Wilson with Half Associates. You know, to build on that, ultimately what you want is, a, is you know, we want to work with BRA staff because, as you know, staff rotates. They retire. Uh, they may go someplace else. Uh, other things happen where people come and go. When you want a strategic plan that's going to take you into the future, you've got to make sure that that story is told over and over and over again to each staff person that comes in. They need to understand the programs. They need to understand the goals. Um, it's just a very important process. It's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, being a football-minded person, uh, you know, when new coaches come on board, they don't ask the new coach uh, to implement his way of doing it. He ask, They ask him to adapt it to his way. So it's building on the team. We don't want to recreate the team every time a new staff member comes on. We want that playbook to continue on and on. Now, yes, it will be able to pivot and move and change as things get adapted, but we want that story, those efforts, that technology to continue to uh, translate uh, further on down. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Other questions from committee members? Jim, I have another question. Yes, ma'am. So um, once selected, how long will it take for you to deliver a product to the BRA as far as your priorities and recommendations? Uh, this is Lenny Hughes from HALF, and again, this will be started on the uh, development of the pre-scoping meeting as well as during the, the project kickoff. Uh, we anticipate, anticipate this time frame lasting anywhere from 18 months to, to two years. And so that includes, uh, again, the database collection, uh, establishing the, the protocol for meetings and, and set up, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the scale of, uh, and depth of public engagement, uh, for the process, and, and as well as understanding, you know, what properties, once we go through this evaluation, uh, that you know, that BRA would like to uh, keep and retain or look at opportunities to divest. And so from there, we would start to develop a roadmap that goes through uh, the processes uh, for uh, throughout the, this plan. I'd also like to turn it over to um, Andrew Iker to talk about as well. Well, just to build on what Lenny said, um, this could also be phased. Again, it's going to go back to the uh, the, pre, the, pre, the scoping meeting, uh, understanding BRA's priorities. Um, but, you know, if the, if the ultimate project is going to last 18 months to two years, like Lenny said, there could be pieces that are phased. Again, we won't really know that until we are, are able to scope with BRA, but we can see they're looking at different parts of the basin in different phases. Uh, or phasing the obviously the, the GIS data collection is going to have to come as, as part of an early phase. Um, so again, I, I think the ultimate timeline, like Lenny said, is probably 18 months to two years, but there could be interim deliverables in there as well, depending on how we scope the project. Yeah, and building upon those interim de deliverables, we think that just from our understanding, uh, initial meeting, that possum kingdom may be a high priority. And so we are able to uh, quickly move resources uh, from our, our large staff capacity to either focus on, on the Possum Kingdom region or other areas that the, the BRA would like to focus on. And so having that, that bench strength, as, as Andrew had mentioned time and time again before, we're able to quickly uh, mobilize and, and start to develop prioritization for, for BRA. Say Globe Group. Uh, this is Jonathan, um, and I'll ask uh, some other people to, to give input on this. I love this question. It's a challenging one. My answer is next week. 
Um, the first thing we need to do is sit down with you all and have a detailed conversation about how we are going to work together. Um, again, that's what you all requested in the RFP, and that's what we would want to do in this process. Now, there are all kinds of deliverables that we can create from this. As you all have seen from both of these presentations, there is a massive amount of work that could potentially come under the proposals that each team has submitted. But we need to figure out what your needs are. Now, I'll go back to Mr. Fernandez's initial question and kind of outline some of the timeframes that could be associated with that. If we're looking at an overall database for the basin, that's something that we can begin to operationalize that you all can start using to analyze properties somewhere around four months. Now, that won't be a complete database, but it gives us direction and it is an interim product that we can build over time. If you all decided there was a particular piece of property that you all wanted to work on, you wanted to have a stakeholder process on, you wanted to begin planning, um, we could do that in approximately nine months. And so that would include a assessment of the properties, that would include a stakeholder process, that would include planning, scenario planning, and it would include interaction with you all. And an important thing to always remember in these timeframes, we could say we could do everything in the next three months, but we, if we want to be successful and if we want to create those types of prod projects that you all are going to be happy to have when you turn 100 or 200, it's going to be important to get BR, BRA staff involved. And frankly, we're really excited that this selection process is including the board. So you have a driving leadership component of this process. So getting all those folks involved, numerous who are very busy, needs to be built into those timeframes. The question is a great one. Um, it will vary based on our discussions with BRA, but that would be the first thing we would do, and we would start that process next week. Um, Kara, I'm wondering if you could kind of outline how you see stakeholder processes and timeframes associated with them and kind of that good feel on it. Sure. Um, just are, can you like all hear me right now? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, you know, again, I think that's something that's really flexible. We see that stakeholder engagement process to be an iterative one based on conversations with you all. Um, we've done those types of, um, of stakeholder processes from start to finish in as short as three months and as long as three years. So, it's hard to say without further conversation from you what exactly we would um, we would recommend. It kind of depends on um, on how this scope shakes out. And Mike from Studio Outside, I'd last ask you to comment on that as well. Yeah, I think um, Jonathan, there's uh, everything's kind of tied together, right? So I'm, I'm going to hopefully I'll give you an answer that's not too uh, too vague. We can, um, a lot of our planning work builds the story from a lot of the assessment work that happens. So when we start to, if we're going to start to look at, let's say, site use scenarios and how a particular site starts to evolve, we need a lot of that site mapping to kind of start prior to that. But what can happen is, you know, typically in all these projects, right, we always draw these things in these beautiful linear lines, but there's really a lot of overlap of how scopes can start and stop. So I think some of the stuff that, that Kara does with the stakeholder engagement and the discovery workshop, which is really specifically with the client group, those can be early on to start to really drill down for our team to understand your mission and how your mission trans tr translates out into goals and other metrics that drive the plan. Because once we have that foundation in place, then we will be able to provide a holistic portfolio plan or specific site plans and be able to present them to you through your goals and metrics, how they respond to those components. So there are aspects that, like Jonathan said, we can start pretty quickly um, to start to build that foundation. And then other aspects just kind of fall in line right with that. So what we have been able to do successfully is – I always kind of say that, you know, fee and time are just things that we work through and negotiate through. So whatever milestone dates that you may have coming up that you need X for, you know, we can always look at that and reverse engineer our process to make sure that we're giving you 
a key deliverable or a key component that you need to help other initiatives you might have going on to kind of give life to those. So that's a component that we'll definitely want to understand as well is not just our timeline, but understand how it needs to infuse into your timeline. Thank you very much. Other questions from the committee members? Jim, I don't have a question. This is Lloyd. I wanted to thank everybody for the fantastic presentations. I hate that we have to make a choice. Appreciate you all and your time very much. Thank you. I think we all agree with that. We've seen two very, very well done presentations and we appreciate all the all the work. I know you don't snap your fingers and make these uh, make these things happen. Um, with that, we'll close the question session and uh, move on to our regular agenda. Item number one is a report and possible discussion on presentations from the firms responding to RFP number 20-03-1159 relating to the development of a Brazos River Authority property master plan and other applicable real property manners. David? Yes, sir. Do you have any discussion? Uh, I do not. Okay. Members of the committee? Could you repeat your question, Jim? Sure. Um, we're we're at item, item number one on the agenda, the report and possible discussion on presentation from the firms. Uh, I can read the whole thing to you, but if there's any discussion, I'd entertain that now. John Henry, did you have anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm like Wesley. I don't, they're two great presentations. I'm, I feel inadequate trying to make a decision. <laughs> can I clarify? Uh, can I, I think we've moved to agenda item number two. The, the presentations were agenda item number one. I think yeah. that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, item, number two, item number two is to deliberate for uh, the committee to deliberate how they want to move forward. Yeah, just My, you're right. You're right, David. I was interested in any discussion. So item two, uh, there being no discussion, item two is discussion and possible action on the selection of a firm in response to the RFP number 20-03-1159 relating to the development of the Brazos River Authority property master plan and other applicable real property manners. David, do you have? I, I do not have any discussion, Chairman. Okay. I just would be interested in uh, uh, just hearing from the committee on on what their thoughts are. Yep. I see John Henry Letton has his hand raised. Oh. John? Yes, sir. I, I was unclear going in what we were. I thought we would probably just be looking at more divestiture so this was a much broader scope project than i was anticipating in my opinion i felt like the the uh, maybe the half group was a more they were already ahead of the game on moving forward with this with this deal they were a little more specific and focused that's just my opinion. Okay. Are there are there other committee members that have a 
I have a thought. Jim, Jim, this is Wayne Wilson. Yes, Wayne. Uh, I sure hate to say something against what John Henry just said, but I kind of was leaning towards the Siglo group myself. Thank you. Wesley, you've got your hand up. Uh, well, I was just wondering, I don't, I don't feel totally equipped today uh, to make a, make a decision. And um, I wonder if staff has enough interaction leading up to this point that they might be able to provide input, even if it's another day and we, we defer. Uh, I don't know if that's possible or not under the uh, posting. I guess it's always possible as long as we vote to, to take no action. But um, I'm wondering if anybody else thinks that that would be helpful um, to uh, talk to staff, maybe to council also, maybe maybe even an executive session um, with with Lee and in the group. I'm not advocating that. That's not a motion. I'm just wondering if anybody else feels that way. Uh, this is this is Director Tallis. I have a, a David. This is maybe a point of order. Can you remind me? Are is the committee just making voting to make a uh, a suggestion to the board to vote on eventually? What is our goal today? So our our goal today was to allow you to hear the two presentations that you did, uh, and for to deliberate to make a recommendation to take to the board uh, in October. Uh, the, the the board in its entirety would have to vote on on uh, who who we negotiated a contract who who we ultimately hired. Uh, so you know one of, you know one of the options is obviously for you all to deliberate today. Uh, if you if you're uh, you, you heard a tremendous amount of information, and if you want to go back and and sleep on it and think about your notes. Uh, and, and think about it, we can we could schedule another meeting for us to get together and talk uh, to to continue your deliberation. Laura Lee, would you would you chime in and make sure that I'm saying that that's correct? That's absolutely correct. No action has to be taken today. Certainly, if if the committee members would like some time to take deliberation and have some time to go back through, I don't know. I'm assuming we have the PowerPoints, look at the material presented. It was a lot to to glean in a very short window of time, we could just reschedule another meeting and at that meeting not hear presentations, but rather allow for deliberation. I would, uh, uh, Laura Lee, the, 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 uh, the package that we have in, uh, in Diligent is, is very complete and has all of, the, all of the information that the two proposers presented. Um, it might well be that that our best move forward is to is to give the committee time to to go back through that. I don't disagree. It's 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 been a long morning and lots of information thrown at us. Right. So maybe that's maybe that's a good solution. Uh, Director Lachance, you had your hand up, and then Wesley Lloyd. I did. Um, I I actually agree with with Wesley and, and now Laura Lee's comments and I do agree that we've had a lot of information uh, most importantly I think um, I would like to spend a little bit of time with staff and and talk through some questions and comments and uh, really seek their feedback since they are uh, closer to this and have more information I think I could make a better decision that way so I too would be a proponent of of pushing back to the next meeting and using this time between now and then to really have a make a make a firm decision. This is a big a big uh, commitment. It's a long term commitment, and I think it's extremely important that we do our due diligence to make sure that we're making the best decision possible. Thank you Thanks. very much, Director Lloyd. I apologize. I did not know I had to put my hand down. <laughs> it's, I would have known that in person. I wouldn't have sat there with my hand in the air, but, uh, but I'm sorry. No, I didn't have any other questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Director Lattimore, I have yeah. a comment. Yes. So um, I agree. I think we need to take some time 
to evaluate and review. Um, we did receive lots of information, but ultimately I want to remind the committee um, as well as the board members who are watching. I mean, we have a responsibility and I know I say that I say this quite often and our, our responsibility is to protect our water and make sure we have water and create water um, for Texans. And so we need to make sure that we are keeping that on the forefront, that we're not just making a recommendation today because we feel like we have to, because we've heard two great presentations. But I do want us to take some time. And like Tracy said, uh, let's talk to staff, um, review, and I would recommend um, having another uh, opportunity to, to come back as a committee um, to make a recommendation to the full board. And I, I, I would uh, I would agree the the result of any of our actions is only a recommendation to the board. Um, this committee does not have the power to approve or disapprove. So as we go forward, we I think we need to keep that in mind that ours is only a recommendation and the full board will make the final decision. Um, if there's other discussion, we'll entertain that. Otherwise, I'd hear a motion for uh, for further action. I'm sorry, Jim, before before uh, a motion for further action, this is Mike Fernandez, and I don't know. I, I agree with uh, with the sentiment. Uh, we need to take some more time to to consider this, but I didn't know if uh, if if we were too late to go back and uh, ask one more question of the firms. Uh, is that a possibility or have we moved on past that? No, I think uh, the, the the only thing we can't do is the firms can't come address us directly, but you can certainly address a question to the firms. And I think they're both still here, aren't they, David? Uh, I'm assuming so. We are. Yeah. Okay. Go uh, ahead, Director Fernandez. Thank you. Uh, I don't recall who... Uh, who took the first turn on the last question? Uh, does anybody recall specifically? I think you I, can go whichever think, direction you want. I think I think half was respond on the last question. Okay, so uh, so my question will first go to, to Jonathan then at Siglo. Um, and the question, I mean, it, again, it, it's for both both firms. Uh, when we talk about uh, databases and and essentially software uh utilization within a within an organization uh and half kind of touched on this there there is ongoing uh need for support and maintenance into the future uh and for the ability for staff to to put information in uh going forward and you know in my experience what i've seen is is usually that comes along with some type of uh service agreement or licensing or or something to that effect uh, what what does the the financial aspect of ongoing support look like? Obviously, I'm not looking for numbers, but but are there annual agreements to consider? You know, are we are we committing to you know a lifetime of uh, uh, software subscription with with either of these deliverables? Um, this is Jonathan with Sigla Group. That is a great question, and uh, I I think all of us who work in the GIS industry um, sometimes feel captive to some of those softwares, um, even proprietary ones or ones that we're making. So in general, uh, like a number of the other industries, there are specific softwares that are used. Um, I am certain that BRA has license is um, for the types of softwares we use. Um, and so there would be no additional cost associated with those softwares. Uh, what we generally do is when we're working with uh, different organizations, we look at what their internal expertise are and how they can use the softwares. Now, there might be uh, a, um, a, a company or an organization that needs us to really dumb down the information, make it very simple. Um, but generally, a lot of larger organizations such as BRA have institutionalized GIS information. And so our goal is to train them up 
and make sure that they can use the information, make sure that they can use the model that we're, the procedural model that we are creating for them with their input. And so probably the equivalent uh, example is the city of San Antonio. We worked with uh, approximately 23 different scientists to create the model that they're using to determine uh, where to acquire properties for water s supply protection. And then we worked with three city of San Antonio staff that had GIS capabilities. And as we were developing the model, they had input as we were uh, once we completed the model, we trained them up on it, and there was a transitional period where we're running the model for them, they're understanding the results, and eventually we trained them to run the model. And so that's happened, I think, three different times. Uh, their, their allocations for dollars happen every five years. So within that first year of each of those five years, we were working with them to create that model. And then the next four years, they ran it on their own. Then there's a revision of that model and the process happens again. We've also worked with Katy Prairie Conservancy, which is in your uh, watershed. And what we did for them is created a simpler model where the folks there can, can run it. Um, but if they need any higher level assessment, we'll go in and help them out on an as needed basis. It could be that you all decide you want some type of retainer as well, and so that can work. Um, GIS information, it has a temporal aspect, so any of those variables that we were looking at, they were going to change over time. Not all of them, but many of them will. And so they'll be, as you all want to become up to date, you want to make sure that that information is being updated. That's something that BRA staff can do and we can train them to do, but as needed, we can also support you all in that effort. Thank you, Jonathan. It's Darren Atkinson with Half Associates. Um, so as, as far as the, the licensing of third-party software, uh, we're going to work with BRA to determine what software is already in place, and we want to mimic that. We want to make sure that we're leveraging the investment uh, the authority has already made in software. We don't want to add to the mix. Software can get extremely expensive, and so we're not looking to uh, extend that. Um, with regards to the data, uh, HAF is very sensitive to data ownership. On all of our uh, service contracts that we put in place, we have a very specific clause that says the client owns all the data. HAF has no interest in trying to hold uh, GIS data hostage. Uh, that, that is a very poor way of going about things. So we, we're very forward with that and we want to make sure that uh, BRA understands that uh, at the end of the day, BRA, it's their data. Now, as far as through the course of the project, most likely uh, half associates will store that data on our infrastructure because we're going to be working with it. But at some point, we're assuming that we will either transfer that data over to BRA to take stewardship and move it forward. Or if, the, if BRA is interested, we do offer hosting solutions. Uh, it's on a year by year basis. Uh, there is no long-term commitment. It's up to the Brazos River Authority to decide when is it best for them to take ownership of the data and of the application. Uh, we want to make sure that we're developing it um, in a way that ultimately it is transferred over so they can exist in perpetuity, uh, managed by the authority without incurring additional costs over time. So we've done this uh, quite a few times. Uh, I mentioned before, we provide hosting for quite a few entities, uh, but over the years, uh, especially with GIS data, a lot of times we'll start it uh, because there are no GIS capabilities uh, at a particular client site, and then two or three years into the process, they're ready. And so we'll actually work with them to transfer that information over. Uh, as Aaron, this is Lenny. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the day-to-day -day uses, uh, as well as um, the, the training aspects of it? Yes. Yeah. So the uh, once we get into the deliverables, uh, half provides resources on an as-needed basis, just time and materials. Uh, we do that two ways. One is uh, through training, as Lenny just mentioned. We want to make sure that all the staff are up to speed. Usually, uh, it's uh, anywhere from half a day to maybe a full day, depending on the breadth and scope of the total application. Uh, 
but it's all web-based, and so the training uh, requirements are pretty low. Uh, they, you don't have to be a, a GIS professional to understand how to use uh, the, the tools and the uh, analysis environment that we deliver. Uh, so we'll do that initially, and then we're always available to come back if there's new staff. Uh, we'll come back at a later time and provide additional training. Uh, software, technology, it changes constantly. Uh, we'll also be uh, available, not, not on a retainer, but just give us a phone call if enhancements need to be made, if you know new technologies come out to make it faster. Uh, you know, if you're using the Esri RTS uh, software, you know that they're putting out new versions every year. So uh, a lot of times, you know, something else comes out that's new that needs to be adjusted for, uh, and we'll be there to support you if changes need to be made. Thank you. All right. Um, do we, I guess, Laura Lee, I'll ask you, do we need a motion to to table this until a later date? I think that's perfectly appropriate to make a motion to table and reschedule for a subsequent public meeting would be appropriate. Yep. Okay. I'd, uh, I would entertain a motion then to table this discussion to be rescheduled at a later date. So moved. Who is that? John Henry. John Henry moved. Is there a second? Yes, me. We'll ask Lloyd. Director Lloyd seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We'll table it and uh, reschedule. David, if you and your team will do so. We will. We'll give the committee uh, ample time to go back and review uh, the information, and then we'll get us back together soon and uh, continue continue discussions. And I and I assume the full package will stay available on diligent for the directors. Absolutely, you bet. Okay, everybody's got access to diligent. Director Lachance has her hand up. I do, um, David. This might be towards you. Um, is Aaron our lead contact on contacting the staff for this if we have questions? Uh, John John Dixon would be uh, just any questions you have, just forward them to me and I'll get them to the right person. Would be perfect. Okay. Um, we have nothing else on the agenda. I would entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. So move. John Henry Lutton moves to adjourn. Is there a second? Second, Ford Taylor. Ford Taylor seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. aye. Any nays? All right. Uh, David, you and your team will uh, reschedule this when we're ready to reconvene. Absolutely. Thank you all for your time and Siglo and uh, 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 golly, PATH. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you all for your time today, too. Great job. Two great presentations. Very thank good. you all. Yes, appreciate it. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.